You monitor the standard ECG leads, like one, two, or three, with this ECG cable. You can also monitor the ECG with these therapy electrodes, otherwise known as quick combo electrodes. These electrodes can be used for monitoring, pacing, defibrillation, and synchronized cardioversion. First, we'll cover the standard leads using the four-wire cable. Attach it to the green port and turn on the monitor. Now the electrodes. You've probably gotten by applying ECG electrodes without skin prep, and the tracing was okay. But more likely than not, noise is going to be a problem. You can save yourself a lot of time by following these basic recommendations to decrease noise. Put the electrodes on the lead wire first before you apply them to the patient. Choose a site with minimal hair or shave the site. Scrape the skin like this with the electrode backing to remove dead skin cells. Secure the ECG cable to prevent tugging on the lead wires and electrodes. Okay, electrodes are on. Select the lead you want to monitor. If you see a dashed line and paddles, press lead just once to automatically select lead two. If you want to change the size, press size until you get the size you want or use the speed dial. Now let's monitor with the therapy electrodes. Clear clothing from the chest and prep the skin for good contact. Don't put electrodes over medication patches, ECG electrodes, or implantable devices. Wipe the skin clean and dry if necessary. Shave the sites if necessary. Now, look at the picture on the therapy electrode. This one goes on the patient's upper right torso, lateral to the sternum, and below the clavicle. Press it down firmly to get good contact. Place the other electrode under the arm. Place it lateral to the patient's left nipple in the mid-axillary line. Connect the therapy electrodes to the therapy cable. If you don't see an ECG, you need to switch to paddles lead. Press lead once, and it will automatically change to paddles lead. That's ECG monitoring. Remember, the monitor screen is intended only for basic rhythm interpretation and not ST segment or other diagnostic interpretation. For that, you'll need to obtain a 12-lead ECG, which is covered in the 12-lead section. STEMI management is a priority in patient care, and the 12-lead ECG is necessary for diagnosis. To obtain an accurate 12-lead ECG, proper electrode placement is crucial. Let's go over how to do that. With practice, you'll get very quick at it. Just like ECG monitoring, we have the limb leads, but for acquiring a 12-lead ECG, we need to put the limb leads out here on the limbs. You can put the electrodes anywhere along the limbs, just not on the torso. Okay, we have the limb leads on. Let's do the precordial leads. Now, we're going to position these leads around the patient's heart, here. We recommend finding the right spots like this. Start with your finger at the notch in the top of the sternum. Move it down until you feel a little elevation. That's the angle of Louis, where the manubrium joins the body of the sternum. Move your finger to the patient's right a little and drop it into the second intercostal space. Down a little to the third intercostal and one more to the fourth intercostal space. Put the first electrode right there. From the first electrode, run your finger across the sternum to the fourth intercostal space on the patient's left. Place the second electrode right there. Next, we're going to skip over the third electrode and place the fourth. Move down to the fifth intercostal and then to the mid-clavicular line, right there. Place the fourth electrode. Now go back and put the third electrode halfway between the second and fourth electrodes. There. Good. The fifth and sixth electrodes are both at the same level as the fourth. Put the fifth on the anterior axillary line. And put the sixth on the mid-axillary line. Good. Now, before we acquire a 12-lead ECG, let me make a couple of other points about electrode placement. With a female patient, you might need to place the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth leads underneath the breast rather than on the breast. 
You can see how the placements are adapted in this particular case. And never use the nipple as a reference for lead placements on either men or women. Nipple locations just vary too much from patient to patient. Okay, all the electrodes are on. Connect the precordial lead attachment to the ECG cable like this. Ask the patient to lie still and push this button to acquire a 12 lead. This is the first 12 lead ECG for this patient, so the age menu appears. Use the speed dial to enter the patient's age and sex. Both are important for the analysis algorithm to provide correct interpretive statements. If you don't enter anything, the defaults of 50 and male are used for the interpretation. It will take a few seconds to acquire the data. It acquires a 12 lead ECG, analyzes, stores it, then prints it out automatically with lots of useful information. Here's the printout. This is an example of a three channel standard format. Other formats are available. Notice the word unconfirmed at the top of the report. This means that the algorithm's interpretive statements should only be used to prescribe or withhold treatment when the ECG waveform data has been confirmed by qualified medical personnel. There's a feature of the LifePak 15 you should know about called ST Trending. It can be very useful in STEMI management. Be sure to watch the section on vital sign and ST segment trends and read about it in the operating instructions. Okay, now one thing that can go sideways is when you press 12 lead, you might get this message. Noisy data. Press 12 lead to accept. The noise is usually patient or electrode related. So here are some preventive things you can do to avoid common sources of ECG noise in the first place. Use fresh electrodes from sealed packages. Develop the habit of a brisk skin prep. Make sure the patient is warm and comfortable with arms and legs supported. That goes a long way to reduce noise from muscle tension. Try to wait at least 30 seconds after applying the electrodes before you press 12 lead. Electrodes need a little time to stabilize. Secure the lead wires and the cable to eliminate any tugging on the electrodes. When the noise is eliminated, the 15 automatically completes the 12 lead report. If you've done everything you can but the noise still persists, look for electronic interference from radios or other electronic equipment. And, like the message says, you can press 12 lead again despite the noise. The 12 lead ECG will be printed, but without the interpretive statements. If you have to defibrillate, be sure to remove all the electrodes that could interfere with therapy electrode placement. Oxygen saturation, carboxyhemoglobin, and MET hemoglobin monitoring are known as SpO2, SpCO, and SpMET. Together, all three are known as rainbow set technology. Your LifePak 15 monitor defibrillator may or may not have the capability to monitor all three. There are two ways to check if your device has CO or MET. The first is to watch the screen closely when you power on the 15. All the vital sign capabilities display briefly. Watch the SpO2 display area here closely during startup. There. This 15 can do all three. If it were only capable of SpO2, you would have seen only SpO2 during that flash. The other way to check is to highlight the SpO2 area and click it. You'll see what you have available here. If you want to monitor SpO2, CO, and MET, you have to use a rainbow sensor. If your sensor is only capable of monitoring SpO2, you won't be able to monitor CO and MET. But in this case, both our monitor and our sensor are capable of all three. So, the monitor's on, connect the rainbow sensor here firmly. Now the rainbow sensor looks like a standard SpO2 sensor, but to accurately measure SpCO and SpMET, proper sensor placement is much more important. The preferred site is the ring finger of the non-dominant hand. Put it on the patient like this, with the cable on the back of the hand. Slide it on until the fingertip touches the raised stop inside the sensor. Good. Shield the sensor from ambient light and have the patient hold still while it self-calibrates. Calibration can take 15 to 30 seconds. Confirm that the reading appears and is stable. If you use SpO2 alone, without ECG monitoring, the SpO2 pulse rate is shown here. The height of this bar indicates the quality of the signal. If you want, you can display the SpO2 plethysmograph, or pleth waveform, on the screen. Use the speed dial to outline channel 2 or 3, click it, and scroll through the channel menu to select SpO2. The waveform is automatically sized for optimum viewing. 
Now let's look at SPCO and MET. When the patient is connected to a rainbow sensor and we have a good SpO2 reading, SPCO and SPMET are also monitored continuously in the background. When the patient's CO or MET is abnormally elevated, for example, the patient's CO goes over 10% or MET goes over 3%, an advisory occurs. There's an alarm tone, an advisory message, and the elevated value starts flashing here instead of the SpO2. To acknowledge the advisory, press alarms. The SpO2 replaces the CO value, but the advisory message stays on the screen until the value drops below 10%. The SpMet advisory works the same way. So, if you are monitoring with a rainbow sensor and there is no advisory, then you know that the patient's CO is less than 10% and MET is less than 3%. But if you want to check those actual readings, there are two ways to do it. You can press print and get a print out of the vital signs. You see the CO and MET values up here on the strip. Or you can manually display the value in the SpO2 area. Rotate the speed dial to outline the SpO2 area and press it. Select parameter from the menu and then select SPCO or MET. The value displays for 10 seconds, then reverts to SpO2. If you have difficulty getting a stable signal or the value shown is questionable, consider these factors. Is the sensor size correct for the patient? Consider using a pediatric sensor for adults with small fingers. Is the sensor aligned properly on the patient's finger? Try taking it off and putting it back on again. Make sure the tip of the finger touches the raised stop inside the sensor. Is the sensor too tight? Is the sight well perfused? Some patients have different levels of perfusion on different fingers. Try another finger. If there are notable temperature differences, use the warmer finger. Is the patient moving excessively? If so, get the patient to hold still or move the sensor to a less motion-prone location. It's especially important to keep a rainbow sensor motionless during its self-calibration process. Is there interference from bright lights like sunlight or emergency lights? You should cover the sensor to block the light. Again, that's particularly important while a rainbow sensor is self-calibrating. If the readings still seem questionable, get two or more readings from different fingers and average them. And remember, it's important to be familiar with your sensor's instructions for use. The SpO2, CO, and MET monitor has built-in messages to help troubleshoot problems that may occur. Refer to the troubleshooting tips and the operating instructions for the messages and corrective actions. Remember, SpO2, CO, and MET monitoring are tools to be used in addition to patient assessment. So, let's take out blood pressure, or NIBP, with the LifePak 15 monitor defibrillator. Select the proper sized cuff for your patient. Put it on the arm nice and snug. The exact position of the cuff is not important because the cuff does not have a bladder. It inflates completely around the extremity. But don't put the cuff on the same arm as an IV infusion because it could affect the IV flow. Also, NIBP will affect SpO2 readings. Connect the tubing to the 15. Push it straight in until you hear a snap. The default inflation pressure is 160 millimeters of mercury, but if you have a pediatric patient or you suspect your patient's blood pressure is higher than 160, you may need to change the default inflation pressure. To change it, use the speed dial to select NIBP. Select Initial Pressure, then select the pressure you want. Okay, keep your patient's arm in a supported position, relaxed and at about the same level as their heart. Tell them they'll feel a big squeeze and remind them not to move their arm during the measurement. Now press NIBP, and the 15 automatically inflates the cuff. It usually takes about 40 seconds to complete the measurement. Here's where the systolic, diastolic, and mean arterial pressures are displayed. If ECG or SpO2 is not active, then the 15 will show you the pulse rate from the NIBP here. So now you know how to take an initial BP. What if you need a recurring BP on your patient? Here's how to do it. Select the NIBP area. This time, select interval and choose how many minutes you want between measurements. We'll choose five. Select start or press NIBP 
and the Life Pack 15 will take up pressure at five minute intervals. Here are some important considerations. Patient motion can prolong the measurement process and may cause discomfort. Be sure the patient's arm is relaxed and that the cuff is not bumping against other objects. Patient arrhythmias can prolong the NIBP measurement time. If the monitor is unable to obtain a reading in 120 seconds, then it automatically deflates the cuff. If the cuff fails to deflate for any reason, or if it causes the patient undue discomfort, disconnect it from the tubing or remove the cuff from the patient. If you find it routinely takes a long time to inflate the cuff, there may be an air leak in the system. Check the cuff and the connections. There are messages built into the NIBP monitor to help troubleshoot problems. Refer to the troubleshooting tips in the operating instructions for the messages and corrective actions. Remember, NIBP is a tool to be used in addition to patient assessment. End tidal CO2 monitoring, or capnography, is another helpful tool in the LifePak 15 monitor defibrillator. Use it to continuously measure the expired carbon dioxide in adult and pediatric patients. It's important to be familiar with your filter line's instructions for use. Okay, let's set up for monitoring. You'll be working with these microstream accessories, either the airway adapter and filter line for intubated patients, or a nasal filter line for patients who are not intubated. The 15 is on, open the connector door, and connect the filter line. Turn the filter line clockwise until it is tight. There's a CO2 initializing message, and you see dash marks here for the respiratory rate. You can display the CO2 waveform in channel 2 or 3. Use the speed dial and select CO2 from the menu. The waveform will be a dashed line until the monitor finishes initializing. Then it becomes a flat line. Now, put the filter line on the patient and there is your CO2 value and waveform. The monitor automatically selects the scale for the best visualization of the waveform. For your reference, CO2 must be greater than 3.5 for the waveform to appear, and at least 8 to recognize a breath and count a respiratory rate. The respiratory rate is averaged over the last 8 breaths. The end tidal CO2 monitor has a built-in apnea alarm. Once a valid breath has been detected, the apnea alarm triggers if the monitor hasn't detected a breath for 30 seconds. The message, alarm, apnea, appears, and the time since the last detected breath. You can temporarily silence the alarm tone by pressing alarms. First check the patient and whether the filter line is still attached. The alarm clears when the next breath is detected. When you're done with CO2 monitoring, disconnect the filter line and dispose of it. Do not reuse, sterilize, or clean CO2 accessories. They are for single patient, one-time use. There are messages built into the CO2 monitor to help troubleshoot problems. Refer to the troubleshooting tips and the operating instructions for the messages and corrective actions. Remember, CO2 monitoring is a tool to be used in addition to patient assessment. Invasive pressure, or IP monitoring, can monitor arterial, venous, and other physiological pressures. The LifePak 15 monitor defibrillator can monitor two invasive pressures simultaneously. Okay, let's set up the 15 for invasive pressure monitoring. The first thing you'll need to do is set up your transducer system according to your local protocol. Make sure you're already familiar with the instructions for use of your transducer and infusion set. Position the transducer at the phlebostatic axis. Now, connect the invasive pressure cable to the transducer and then to the P1 connector on the monitor. The default label is P1. To select a different label, outline and select the P1 vital sign area. Select label and choose the label you want. To see the waveform, use the speed dial to select channel 2 or 3, select the waveform, and the label you want for the waveform. The next thing we need to do is zero the transducer. Open the stopcock to air and select zero from the menu. When the zeroing is complete, the message P10 appears. Now close the stopcock. 
The patient's waveform should be displayed, and a scale is automatically selected to display the pressure. There are messages built into the IP monitor to help troubleshoot problems. Refer to the troubleshooting tips in the operating instructions for the messages and corrective actions. Remember, IP monitoring is a tool to be used in addition to patient assessment. Special training is required to use IP monitoring. The LifePak 15 temperature monitor is intended to continuously monitor body temperature. You will need the temperature adapter cable and one of these single-use disposable temperature probes, the esophageal rectal, the Foley catheter, or the skin probe. Not all temperature probe connector cables are compatible with the LifePak 15. Make sure you only use the adapter cable that is approved for use with the 15. Okay, connect the cable to the temp port on the 15. Then connect the probe to the cable, like this. And attach the temperature probe to the patient according to the instructions for use that came with the probe or your local protocol. You can also place the probes first, especially Foley catheters and esophageal, like the one seen here and then connect them to the adapter cable. It can take up to three minutes for the temperature probe to stabilize after placement. The reading will appear on the monitor as soon as the temperature reading comes into range, between 24.8 and 45.2 degrees Celsius, or 76.6 to 113.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Confirm that the reading appears and is stable. Use the default label temp. If you want to change the label, click the temp area, select temp, and choose a label from the list. Now for some troubleshooting items. If you see the message check sensor and the temperature value is blank like this, then look at the probe and cable. Check that the probe is positioned properly, that the probe and cable are connected properly, and if necessary, replace any damaged probe or cable. If check sensor appears, but a value is still displayed, probably the probe is dislodged and the value has gone below 31 Celsius, 87.8 Fahrenheit, or above 41 Celsius, 105.8 Fahrenheit. The LifePak 15 temperature monitor runs an accuracy check at startup and at intervals during operation. If you see three X's instead of a temperature reading, then the accuracy check has failed in some way. Either the temperature calibration failed or the module has failed. Turn the 15 off and on again. If that doesn't help, you'll need to contact qualified service personnel. And finally, if you've allowed three minutes for the probe to reach equilibrium, but there is still no temperature reading, make sure the probe is positioned properly. Check the connections between probe, cable, and device. Make sure you're using an approved probe and cable. If none of these are the problem, then contact qualified service personnel. That's it for temperature monitoring. When you're done, discard the single-use disposable probe as contaminated medical waste, clean the cable with a germicidal solution on a clean soft cloth, and let the cable dry before you connect it to the monitor again. The LifePak 15 monitor defibrillator can graphically display and document the patient's vital signs and ST segment measurements over time with the trending feature. Here's an example of an SpO2 trend graph over 30 minutes. When the trending feature is on, the monitor samples and stores data from all active vital signs at 30 second intervals. You might see a blank space like this on the graph if data was unavailable at that point for any reason. You can display trend graphs in channel two and three. The patient's ST segment measurements can be trended just like each active vital sign. ST trending starts with the patient's first 12 lead ECG. The part of the patient's ST segment that is measured is the J point. When a 12 lead ECG is obtained, the LifePak 15 automatically chooses the lead with the most STJ displacement to display on the graph. As long as all 10 lead wires remain connected to the patient, it will measure STJ every 30 seconds and plot it. If a lead is off or the ECG data is too noisy, 
ST measurements are not obtained, and the graph shows a blank for that period. If an STJ in any lead deviates from the initial measurement by one millimeter or more, and the deviation persists for two and a half minutes, the monitor automatically prints another 12 lead ECG. To print the trend graphs, select Options, Print, Report, Trend Summary, and Print. Vital sign and ST graphs are tools to be used in addition to patient assessment. When the LifePak 15 monitor defibrillator is set up to power on in AED mode, it follows a predetermined protocol. AED mode is intended for use only on patients in cardiac arrest who are unconscious, not breathing normally, with no pulse or other signs of circulation, and at least eight years old. We're going to look at how AED mode operates using physio-controlled default settings. But be aware that the 15 can be set up differently based on your organization's medical direction. Make sure you're familiar with how your 15 is set up for your protocols. So, let's begin. You have an unresponsive patient. Verify the patient is not breathing normally and has no pulse or other signs of circulation. Turn on the defibrillator. If you can, get the patient onto a hard surface and away from any standing water. Bare the chest. Prep the skin if necessary, as we described in the ECG monitoring section. Place the electrodes in the anterior lateral position, as shown in the picture on the back of the electrodes. Make sure the electrodes do not touch each other, lead wires, ECG electrodes, dressings, or medication patches. Be sure the entire electrode surface adheres to the skin. Place electrodes away from implanted devices if possible. Use fresh electrodes if you have to reapply them. Push, analyze. This message appears and stays up until you push the analyze button. No one should move the patient during analysis, so stop CPR and make sure everyone is clear of the patient. Analyze. Then push the analyze button. Analyzing now. Stand clear. Shock advised. Stand clear. Push shock button. Before you push the shock button, look around to make sure everyone is clear of the patient and clear of anything in contact. Make sure concentrated sources of oxygen are well away from the patient's chest. If it's not safe to push the shock button, you can press the speed dial to cancel the charge. Or if you don't push the shock button within 60 seconds, the defibrillator will automatically cancel the charge. You'll see this message. Push analyze. Push analyze again to reanalyze and charge. Analyzing now. Stand clear. Shock advised. Okay, all clear? Now push the shock button. The defibrillator delivers the shock and gives you this message. Start CPR. The CPR metronome helps you time compressions. There's a message down here to show you the compression of ventilation ratio for the metronome. When it's time for ventilations, the metronome prompts you. Three, two, one, ventilate. Ventilate. If you want to silence the metronome, press CPR. To resume the metronome, press CPR again. At the end of CPR time, the AED prompts for another analysis. Push, analyze. And the whole sequence repeats. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. You've determined the patient is in cardiac arrest. You followed the screen prompts and pushed analyze. Analyzing now. Stand clear. But the AED does not find a shockable rhythm. You get this message. No shock advised. Then it goes straight Start into CPR, CPR time with the metronome and ventilation prompts. At the end of CPR time, push, analyze. it tells you to push analyze, and the cycle repeats as necessary. When advanced users arrive, manual mode may be accessed according to how your 15 is set up. It's important that you're familiar with how to access manual mode in your device. Now, here are a couple of situations that might come up while you're using AED mode. For example, you get the motion detected message. Motion detected. Stop motion. This message might come up while the AED is trying to analyze the patient's heart rhythm, but some kind of motion is interfering with the signal. You should figure out what's causing the motion. Is the patient breathing? Is there transport motion? Is someone touching the patient? CPR, agonal breathing. Remember, do not analyze the patient's rhythm during transport. Motion artifact may affect the ECG signal, resulting in an inappropriate shock or no shock advised decision. 
If the motion is something you can stop, stop it. One other possibility is that there is some kind of electrical or radio interference. Look for anything that might be a source of that kind of interference, like radios or cell phones, and move it away. If the interference is not something you can stop, like agonal breathing, just wait. The AED will finish the analysis and give a decision, even in the presence of motion. Analyzing now. Stand clear. Shock advised. Now, if you have everything connected, but you get this message. Connect electrodes. There may be too much patient hair preventing good contact. Remember to shave excessive hair before applying the electrodes. Or maybe something is wrong with your therapy cable. Check your therapy cable daily using the test load provided with your defibrillator. If you have everything connected and you get this message, connect cable, it's likely that something is wrong with the therapy cable. So again, check your therapy cable daily. Manual defibrillation. First, let me mention that the physio control default configuration for the LifePak 15 monitor defibrillator is to power on in manual mode. If your 15 has been set up to power on in AED mode, access to manual mode might be conditional. It's important that you are familiar with how your defibrillator is set up and how to access manual mode on it. Okay, the 15 is on, we're in manual mode, and we have confirmed that the patient is in cardiac arrest. Place the electrodes in the anterior lateral position. Make sure the electrodes do not touch each other or lead wires, ECG electrodes, dressings, or medication patches. Be sure the entire electrode surface adheres to the skin. If you know the patient has an implanted device, place the therapy electrodes away from it if possible. If you have to reapply therapy electrodes for any reason, replace them with new electrodes. 200 joules is already selected. If you want a different energy level, press Energy Select. Choose the energy level you want. Press Charge. There's a charging tone and a charging bar. Now it's fully charged and you can see the available energy. Look around and make sure everyone is clear of the patient and anything in contact with the patient. Make sure concentrated sources of oxygen are well away from the patient's chest. Look at the screen again to confirm that the rhythm is still shockable. If it's not safe to push the shock button, you can cancel the charge by pressing the speed dial. If you don't push the shock button within 60 seconds, the defibrillator will cancel the charge automatically and you'll see this message. In a case where you do push the shock button, the shock is delivered. Start CPR according to your protocol. To activate the CPR metronome, press CPR. The CPR metronome menu appears and the metronome is activated using the default setting adult, no airway, 30 to 2. If you want to change the metronome setting or stop the metronome, use the speed dial to highlight and select the choices. The metronome gives you talks to time compressions and prompts for ventilation. 3, 2, 1, ventilate. Ventilate. At the end of your CPR period, stop CPR briefly and assess the patient's rhythm. Repeat the shock sequence if necessary. For more information on the CPR metronome settings, refer to the operating instructions. Okay, let's go over a few troubleshooting tips. Now, if you have everything connected and you push the charge button, but you get this message, connect electrodes, there may be too much patient hair preventing good contact. Remember to shave excessive hair before applying the electrodes. 
Or maybe something is wrong with the therapy cable. Check your therapy cable daily using the test load provided with your defibrillator. If you have everything connected and you push the charge button, but you get this message, connect cable, it's likely that something is wrong with the therapy cable. So again, check your therapy cable daily. If you're attempting to defibrillate, but nothing happens when you press the shock button, check to see if sync is on. If it is, turn sync off and proceed with the defibrillation. Let's go through the steps to perform a synchronized cardioversion. Prepare the patient for the procedure according to your organization's protocol. The defibrillator is on and the patient is hooked up to a four-wire ECG cable. We are monitoring lead two. We're using this lead because it's the lead that gives us the tallest QRS complexes. You want to choose the lead with the greatest QRS amplitude or height. It doesn't matter if it's negative or positive, just that it's tall. Now, press the sync button. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the sync mode message telling you that you're in sync mode. The triangles on the ECG are the sense markers. They should appear near the middle of each QRS complex. Don't worry if the placement varies a little bit. If you don't see them at all, adjust the ECG size or select another lead. The sync LED flashes with each detection. Prep the patient's skin and place the therapy electrodes the same way we did for manual defibrillation. Now press Energy Select and select the energy according to your medical protocol. We'll select 100 joules. Okay, now press Charge. Now it's fully charged and here you can see the energy available. If you need to, you can cancel the charge. Before you shock, look around. Make sure everyone is clear of the patient and clear of anything in contact with the patient. Make sure concentrated sources of oxygen are well away from the patient's chest. Look back at the screen and confirm that the sense markers are still sensing appropriately. Good. Now press and hold the shock button until it shocks the patient. That slight delay before the shock was delivered was because the defibrillator discharged on the next sensed QRS. Wait until you see the screen message energy delivered before you release the shock button. After the shock, assess the patient and the ECG rhythm. The physio control default for the LifePak 15 is to return to asynchronous mode after a shock is delivered. But your organization might have changed this default setup. Make sure you're familiar with how your 15 is set up for sync mode in your organization. If the arrhythmia persists and you want to shock again, press sync again. Confirm sense marker placement on the ECG, increase energy according to your protocol, and repeat the charging and discharging sequence. And that's sync cardio version. Okay. Let's go over a few troubleshooting tips. Now, if you have everything connected but you get this message, connect electrodes, there may be too much patient hair preventing good contact. Remember to shave excessive hair before applying electrodes. Or maybe something is wrong with the therapy cable. Check your therapy cable daily using the test load provided with your defibrillator. If you have everything connected and you get this message, connect cable, it's likely that something is wrong with a the therapy cable. So again, check your therapy cable daily. If you have a patient in ventricular fibrillation and you're attempting to defibrillate but nothing happens when you press the shock button, check to see if sync is on. If it is, turn sync off and proceed with the defibrillation. For various reasons, some patients' ECG leads are of low amplitude and difficult to sense appropriately. If this is happening, cycle through each ECG lead until you find the lead with the largest QRS and then increase the ECG size if you need to.
The LifePak 15 monitored defibrillator can be used for either demand or non-demand pacing. Demand pacing is used for most patients, so that's what we'll show here. First of all, before you start pacing someone, always consider the need for patient analgesia or sedation. Okay, connect the ECG leads to the patient. You need to do this for demand pacing, so the pacemaker can see the patient's own beats and deliver pacing pulses only when needed. Also, although the quick combo electrodes can be used both to monitor ECG and for pacing, they can't do both at the same time. So, here we go. We have the ECG leads on and lead two is displayed. Now we'll place the therapy electrodes. We'll use anterior posterior here. You can use either the anterior lateral or anterior posterior position. Prep the skin as we showed you in the ECG monitoring section. Place this electrode with the heart over the left precordium, just below the nipple. It's important to put the electrode with the heart here rather than on the back because if the electrodes are reversed, it might require a higher current to achieve capture. Place the other electrode on the patient's back in the infrascapular area, like this. Be careful to keep adequate separation between the ECG electrodes and the therapy electrodes to minimize artifact on the ECG. Press pacer. You should see sense markers on each QRS, like these. If you don't see sense markers or they're on the T wave, adjust the ECG size or select another lead until you do see sense markers. Now, press rate. Press the up or down arrows to get the rate you need. Press the current up arrow repeatedly to increase the pacing current. Now you can see these pace markers, indicating that pacing current is being delivered. You should notice the patient beginning to twitch. Increase the current until you see electrical capture. You'll have electrical capture when each pace marker is followed by a wide QRS and a T wave, like this. It's important to be aware that the average current needed for capture is between 50 and 100 milliamps. The final step is to ensure that you also have mechanical capture. Palpate the patient's pulse and obtain a blood pressure. Pulse oximetry may also be useful. Observe the patient continuously while actively pacing. The patient's response to pacing therapy may change over time. If you need to check the patient's underlying rhythm, press and hold pause to temporarily reduce the pacing rate. Release the button to resume pacing at the set rate. To stop pacing, press pacer. A few more things. During pacing, you always see dashes up here instead of a heart rate, and the heart rate alarms are disabled. It's important to frequently assess the patient for mechanical capture. If an ECG lead comes off, pacing switches to non-demand, and the monitor shows a dashed line for the ECG. This means the pacemaker paces 100% at the set rate, regardless of the patient's underlying rhythm. To reestablish demand pacing, reattach the ECG electrode. If you're increasing the current, but the patient is not twitching, check the patient's heart rate. Remember that the pacing rate needs to be set higher than the patient's own rate for pacing current to be delivered. If you're pacing and the patient needs to be defibrillated, press charge. Pacing stops automatically. Proceed with defibrillation as described in the manual defibrillation section. And that's it for pacing. You can operate the LifePak 15 monitor defibrillator with these lithium ion batteries or with an AC or DC power adapter. We're going to start by talking about the batteries. The LifePak 15 batteries only work with the LifePak 15. They're not interchangeable with other LifePak devices. A LifePak 15 battery is gray. You should routinely inspect each battery. If you see any leakage or damage, recycle it or discard it. Press this button to check the charge level. This one has a full charge. One LED flashing means it's very low and needs to be charged. If you see more than one LED flashing, it means the battery is faulty and you should send it to your authorized service people. This one is fine, it just needs a charge. This one is almost full, but before you put it in, 
Inspect these pins in the battery wells to be sure there's no damage. Put it in like this. Click it in gently. To remove it, just push this little clip in and tilt the battery out. Okay, two batteries in. Let's power it up and look at battery information. You can see the battery status up here on the home screen. Two batteries are installed and the battery in well one is highlighted. That means it's our power source right now. You can see the charge status for each battery. The 15 automatically uses the battery with the lowest charge first and switches to the other battery when the first battery is exhausted. If I take out the first battery, you can tell there's no battery in well one and the highlight shifted to the second battery. Now it's getting power from that battery. When I put it back, it appears in the display. And since that battery has a lower charge, the 15 switches to it automatically. When the charge gets very low, you'll see the low battery message like this. When both batteries run out, the device shuts off. The 15 will charge the batteries in the battery wells when it's plugged into a power adapter. To use either the AC or DC power adapter, connect the power cord to the adapter and plug it into a power source. You can tell it's connected by this green LED strip here. Now, connect the power adapter cable to the power adapter, like this, and the green end to the defibrillator back here. You know you're connected to auxiliary power when you see this LED lit up. You can tell the status of the battery by this indicator here. The LED is lit when the installed batteries are full and it flashes when either battery is charging. The LED is not lit when there are no batteries installed or when an installed battery is unable to be charged. We're on auxiliary power now, so it's not using either battery. And you can see battery one is recharging. The battery highlight on the screen has disappeared. Although the 15 can operate with only auxiliary power and no batteries, you should have at least one battery in it at all times and keep installed batteries fully charged. If the monitor defibrillator loses power for more than 30 seconds, it reverts to your user default settings and starts a new patient record. You should keep the 15 plugged into the optional DC or AC power adapter whenever possible to help manage and maintain battery charge. Be sure to read the section in the operating instructions on battery maintenance and the external power adapters. If you have the output extension cable with a breakaway connector, it needs to be secured as described in the power adapter instructions for use. It's designed to break away when you need to move quickly, but the connector will last longer if you manually disconnect it whenever possible. Inspect and test everything daily to make sure it's in good operating condition and ready to use. There's an operator's checklist in the back of the operating instructions.